it has become well established. We've done about 400 webinars on various subjects, on too many subjects to count. And we published two books on the webinars that we've done because we try and summarize all the webinars and try and present them because we're trying to create a vibrant body of knowledge that this country has lacked for many years. Um, today, this is the second webinar we are taking up on the state of universities and the crisis in graduate education in Pakistan. There is a huge crisis that nobody wants to talk about. It's hidden under the rug in Pakistan. We are building universities like there's no tomorrow. Universities are not the same as the university. They are not the same as the university. We are not the same as the university. The university is very bad, unfortunately. I will tell you a lot about it. Look, this is the study that we did recently. It's just recently published. The situation we have is that, let me quickly go to this. As you can see, females uh, don't enter the labor force much, but unemployment rates seem to be low if you look at it from the aggregate situation. 6.9% total, but the female and urban rural situation is there in front of you. But the bigger thing that I want to talk to you about is this. Youth faces a huge level of unemployment. You can see people get employed at about 35 to 39. Before that, they face large levels of unemployment and gradually over time, they come down. And what we've noticed is that people in their late 20s, when they're unemployed, they seek to come to universities to do PhDs and MPhils, which is actually destroying the universities. Unemployed among youth with degrees, you can see, is 31%. I think we should all be ashamed of this figure. If 31% of, of our graduates are unemployed, universities must seriously have an internal review. And we should seriously be in a state of debate. And I'm surprised that many vice chancellors don't show up for these debates. I'm really surprised why all vice chancellors are doing nothing else but debating this. Why do we have graduate unemployment of 31%? I think that's a crying shame. The next thing is that there's a large amount of unpaid labor in the economy too. People are working in family firms, etc., or working on the family farm or something, but they are mainly unemployed. But leave, we leave that out for the moment. Average hours worked, you can see people work for longer and get paid less than the minimum wage. Again, a scary fact, but we leave that out. Now, this is a chart that concerns universities and should concern you. Look, formal education, which you are looking at left, there is a lot of difference between high school and high school. It means education is also going to तो बहुत कम लोग हैं जिनको ज्यादा तनख्वाह मिलती है जिसको हम कहते हैं हाई स्कूल प्रीमियम जो बहुत जरूरी है पूरी दुनिया में होता है उसके बाद ग्रेजुएट प्रीमियम को देखें अगर जो ग्रेजुएट कर जाते हैं उन लोगों को आप अगर आप देखें तो उनमें से तकरीबन 50% तो अर्निंग एज मच एज विदाउट एजुकेशन ये वो लोग हैं जो एमफिल लेके पीएचडी लेके चपरासी लग जाते हैं या क्लेरिकल पोजीशन में लग जाते हैं फ्यू पीपल गेट अप टू command the graduate premium. Let's say about 50% of your students command the graduate premium, not all of them. This is another thing that we should worry about. And the large number of them seem to be earning 62,000, which is a very low rate of return graduate education. So we should be concerned about that. I said, lots of kids are sitting outside the labor force. Now we are studying, now we are doing something. Because society has an opportunity to say that people are sitting in their hearts. 33% of people are sitting out of the university. They are sitting out of the university. They are not doing anything. Because they are not doing anything. They don't think they can get anything. So this is a very strange thing. So this was our presentation that we had prepared for you. Now the problem is that we have come to this point. Now let me show you a second presentation of the last webinar that we had done. उसमें जो आ रहा है ये तो फैक्ट्स हमने आपको बता दिए ठीक है जी 
ना द थिंग इज के गवर्नमेंट बहुत सारी यूनिवर्सिटीज बनाती जा रही है बनाती जा रही है अभी आपने सुना है सौ बिलियन की और यूनिवर्सिटीज आ गई है पी पे मैं जब मैं भी प्लानिंग कमीशन में था मैं देखता था सबका जोर था कि बनाते जाओ चीजें जना हमने पुरानी यूनिवर्सिटीज में भी नए कैंपस बना लिए हैं हमने यूनिवर्सिटी के फ्रेंचाइजेस खोल लिए मतलब ऑक्सफोर्ड कैम्ब्रिज फ्रेंचाइज नहीं हुई हार्वर्ड शिकागो फ्रेंचाइज नहीं हुई हमारी यूनिवर्सिटीज फ्रेंचाइज हो गई हैं लाहौर में भी है पिशावर में भी है कराची में भी है कमाल है अच्छा हमारे पास जो यूनिवर्सिटी में हमने एक और काम किया है प्रोफेसर आप लोगों के पास है नहीं लेट्स फेस फैक्ट के प्रोफेसर इवन अकॉर्डिंग टू दी डेफिनेशन ऑफ वेरी few in most universities most universities don't have enough professors to fulfill and uh, uh, to fill a department leave alone the whole university so there is a huge crisis in our universities humne janab ye kiya hai ki humne bahut zyada koshish ki hai ki universities ko sirf ek bana de logon ke baithne ke liye jagah teachers ke liye bhi aur unke liye bhi aur teachers kehte hain hum bas teaching kar rahe hain aur kuch nahi aur unke humne research pe bhi ek kitab likhi thi रिसर्च आपके यहाँ होती कोई नहीं है इट्स जस्ट पेपर मेकिंग और पेपर मेकिंग में जो धांधली है वो प्रवेश सुदपोय लिख चुका है बहुत लोग लिख चुके हैं वो है हमारे पास क्वालिटी ऑफ रिसर्च हमारी बहुत कमजोर है दो चीजें बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है द गवर्नमेंट डज नॉट वॉन्ट टू टॉक टू दूनिवर्सिटीज गवर्नमेंट हैज एब्सोल्यूटली नो डिजायर टू टॉक टू दूनिवर्सिटीज मैं बात करता हूँ रोज वो कहते हैं हमने बात ही नहीं करती उसकी एक वजह है क्योंकि उनको इंटरनेशनल डोनर्स कंसल्टेंट्स आगे बड़े आराम से सब कुछ दे देते हैं और यूनिवर्सिटीज का कोई चैंपियन नहीं है तो यूनिवर्सिटीज बिल्कुल आउट है इसमें यूनिवर्सिटीज का इतना कसूर नहीं है बट ज्यादा कसूर यह यूनिवर्सिटीज की शक्ल नहीं नजर आती जब रिसर्च नहीं नजर आए तो फिर क्या करें वो तो फिर कंसल्टेंट्स के पास जाते हैं तो कंसल्टेंट्स एक्चुअली इंटरनेशनल कंसल्टेंट्स आर डंपिंग ऑन यू बट दूनिवर्सिटी डोंट यून अंडरस्टैंड द डिंग दट टेकिंग प्लेस बिकॉज यूनिवर्सिटीज आर नॉट अ रिसर्च ओरियंटेड प्लेस दूसरा यह है कि एक जो बहुत बात निकली पिछली बारी कि हम कोई कोलेबरेशन कोई नहीं करते साइलो जो बैठे हुए हैं अपना अपना काम कर रहे हैं सारे और वो भी काम सिर्फ पढ़ाने का हो रहा है देर इज रिसर्च का काम बहुत कम हो रहा है फॉर एग्जांपल आपकी यूनिवर्सिटीज में कोई वेबिनार सेमिनार्स नहीं होते बहुत कम ना होने के बराबर है सिर्फ हम पीपीआईडी लीड कर रहे हैं और हम कोशिश करते हैं बाकी लोग भी करें हमारे साथ मिलकर कर रहे हैं पर लोग करते नहीं है तो आपके यहाँ कोई वेबिनार सेमिनार्स नहीं है कॉन्फ्रेंस भी बहुत कम है जो होती है ज्यादातर खाने के लिए होती है तो वी रियली हैव टू फिगर आउट कि हमारी क्या कोलेबरेशन है हाउ डू वी टीच अब मैं कायदे यूनिवर्सिटी में बैठता हूँ कायदे यूनिवर्सिटी और हम कोई टीचर भी नहीं टीचिंग भी नहीं शेयर कर सकते रिसर्च भी नहीं शेयर करते अभी कायदे यूनिवर्सिटी का मेरा ख्याल शायद एक बंदा यहाँ आएगा अबल तो कोई भी नहीं आते बिकॉज दे आर टू बिजी गॉड नोज डूइंग वॉट तो ये मसला तो वट आई वॉन्ट टू रेज विद यू इज ये दिस इज अ क्राइसिस सिचुएशन एंड वी मस्ट टॉक अबाउट एंड यू मस्ट टेल अस कि ये है क्या क्राइसिस क्यों हो रहा है why do we have this uh, situation where things are so bad and we thekedari ka nizam universities ka bana diya humne aur education and knowledge creation is at the back and your students are not getting jobs so i can't think of a bigger crisis so let me begin we've got a great panel and let's talk about this we've got uh, dr uh, professor Hassan Shah from uh, former vice chancellor of GC University we've got uh, professor Naeem vice chancellor of um, uh, Baltistan University of Baltistan Skardu we've got uh, professor Shafiq Rahman vice chancellor of Balochistan Quetta we've got dr Mohsin Khan director IM Sciences and then we'll be joined by professor Zaul Qayyum uh, vice chancellor of uh, Federal Urdu University and then we've got the uh, general adelton rector of fc college so let me begin with you hasan shah professor hasan shah sir would you like to take the lead and tell us you are a former vice chancellor what mess did you leave us with uh, nadeem uh, thank you very much for uh, this invitation and i think you made a few very sweeping statements and uh, i i tend to disagree with that that uh, all research coming out of all pakistani universities is very poor and very bad uh, i think uh, what how is the way you are going to judge research i cannot judge your research you are an economist i am a physicist but there must be some type of a yardstick which is available to all of us to judge whether a research is good or bad and i think one of the Uh, probably the simplest or probably the best yardstick is which are the journals where people are publishing in 
after that i think uh, and if you see the research coming out of pakistani universities at least in the sciences a lot of the research is being published in uh, these uh, journals which are called impact factor journals they have various you know shimago etc they are all uh, you know they are rated uh, differently uh, all over the world and these are the same journals where people from european or american universities are publishing their research so when you get up and say that uh, nothing or everything bad is happening and there is some type of uh, crisis in research of course it is there we we were maybe 20 30 years ago at point 0 but today the situation is not that you are better able to comment on the social sciences but i think the situation in, in sciences is not that despondent after all it is the first time that the universities in the last uh, couple of decades have uh, started uh, uh, getting some funding our laboratories have got some equipment and i think the by and large the faculty has uh, uh, responded social sciences are a different scene i think uh, very few people who were well qualified in the social sciences have made it back to the universities in pakistan uh, uh, after doing their phd's i take uh, uh, look at the economists around you you yourself are an example you never came back to teach in a pakistani university you spent your life abroad so uh, and i think now maybe uh, the situation in social sciences may improve it has always been a stop start situation in pakistan somebody has come in some government and they've given funding the other government has come in and stopped that funding so there has been no tradition which has been made over here in that way uh, we saw good uh, days of hcc then we now are seeing uh, not so good days of hcc funding is going down i agree with you when you say that there are too many universities which are being opened and uh, we are not able to the government is not able to fund these universities of course many of these universities are being opened purely on uh, on political grounds if there is a strong mna or a minister sitting in some district uh, i think it's a vote catching thing for him to uh, you know have a university open but um, certainly i think the situation is not as uh, bleak as you have put out to be and of course nadeem you are exercising and stretching yourself out and uh, uh, i hope that uh, it, it has refreshed you somewhat so well Shari, this, my point is very simple my point is very simple let me put it slightly differently i concede that uh, i can't say much about the sciences but let me also tell you a very simple thing the graduate unemployment situation is alarming Why do we have thirty-one percent graduate unemployment? I think that has to do with the state of the economy, and uh, if there are no jobs in this country, people are not are going to remain unemployed. There are many unemployed PhDs. I don't know whether their PhDs are good or bad, but the fact is that there are not enough job openings to absorb these people. Mm-hmm. and uh, that has nothing to do with the quality of the graduate you may have a graduate uh, coming in from a fancy university abroad and find himself unemployed over here okay uh, that is the state of the economy that is uh, i think uh, has to be looked at uh, differently and you are probably as an economist you should be able to comment on that okay uh, fair so uh, hasan shah sahab thinks that situation is relatively okay not as dismal as i as i think it is so okay let's move to uh, dr naim professor naim sahab what do you think do you agree with hasan shah or with me we've got two polar opposites that's a great one for debate wonderful for debate go ahead mera khayal sir wo shakespeare ka that hamlet that something is rotten in the state of denmark probably uh, higher education uh, in pakistan economy in pakistan and social fabrics and politics probably everything is uh, on the decline here uh, so we are uh, trying to uh, sort of give you a, some sort of positive uh, message from university of baltistan in skardu uh, what i can claim is that you know we are the poorest of the poor people but we live in harmony with the uh, environment over there uh, we are having the highest literacy over there and we are having highest women participation over there but still 
you know, uh, we are trying a newly established university, trying to make it relevant to the local economy. Uh, you know, I don't want to have 100 plus uh, degree programs in this new uh, university. I just want to go with the maybe tourism, uh, glaciers, maybe uh, organic uh, agriculture, tourism and uh, uh, software, and maybe one or two more mines and minerals. Because this is what uh, I'm the custodian of the, uh, you know, one of the best uh, glacier environments uh, on the planet Earth. Uh, I am the custodian of the Indus water uh, sort of uh, security of Pakistan. And that sort of, so I should not be dragged to other, uh, you know, uh, unnecessary uh, disciplines. So that I have to focus one. Uh, second thing, the university has to, uh, you know, bridge uh, networking. Uh, and we are a new university and we are offering an asking for the uh, sort of adoption uh, that the larger, bigger universities within Pakistan, they should adopt the smaller universities. And the good example is that, you know, uh, IPA, uh, Karachi, Lums, Lahore, uh, they have joined us. Uh, Pied has joined us. And last week we had, uh, last month, uh, 24th of February, we had a GP investment conference by Pied and Yusei Baltistan and KIU and Rupani Foundation. This was what probably we were trying to pool our resources and to uh, suggest the government of Gilgit Baltistan how we can uh, invite uh, you know expatriates their investments uh, for our specific you know ecologically friendly mining ecologically friendly tourism in that area and that can create jobs. When I addressed one of the press conference in 2018 in Gilgit Baltistan, they said that you have a new factory in the country. So the idea was that uh, we should not be producing un uh, unemployable graduates from the universities. So I have gone down, uh, you know, uh, not only the BS program, but I can go for small certificate programs, vocational skill programs uh, to remove that sort of, uh, you know, uh, and help uh, employment of the uh, youth uh, who are uh, maybe school dropouts or uh, who are just uh, matriculate schools uh, graduates. So the idea is that, you know, uh, we should have a networking of the consortium. Uh, University of Baltistan is already in a very difficult uh, strategic location, but we are trying to be part of the Himalayan consortium so we can learn from them. Uh, we have offered uh, to IPA, uh, to LAMS, uh, to uh, many universities that we can offer you land in the University of Baltistan, Skardu, 1500 canals of land, and let's have small representation of each of the university can have a small uh, center over there. So that will be a sort of, a, and for three months of the time when the University of Baltistan is closed uh, for winter vacation, we are asking the universities in mainland Pakistan that please open your labs, open your laboratories for our students and faculties so they don't sit along the Bukhari and the uh, you know heating system in Gilgit Baltistan, but they want to come down to Lahore and Islamabad. And I'm glad that you know, uh, all the big uh, players, Alama Iqbal Open University has opened up their uh, doors and uh, Pied has opened uh, Kaidar University and many others. So I think this is a practical way that we should uh, merge our universities, we should uh, consolidate, we should, uh, there should be uh, a exercise maybe after 20, 30 years, uh, those universities who are uh, not able to deliver, they should be uh, closed down and we should not go in the uh, numbers, the 238 uh, at the moment. So I think, you know, uh, there are challenges, uh, but one of the most creative uh, human uh, population, youth population is Pakistan. So the, the good thing is that our youth are most talented and most, uh, uh, you know, uh, they are without uh, drugs, without alcohol, without any other uh, addiction. So probably uh, idea is that universities and the leadership uh, should divert and use these human resources. And uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, and there are, uh, you know, crises in the graduate education that it does not prepare graduates responsive to the changing needs. The focus is on the theories, facts, and histories, and graduate curriculum is uh, teaching uh, doesn't equip students with the real life and survival skills. Or the speed with which we are moving is a snail pace, or slow compared to the high tech, supersonic, quantum speed or leaps of the knowledge. So, my thing is that we Developed countries say, or the other part is that universities Pakistan ki we should learn from within ourselves. We should learn from our neighbors. India is having excellent uh, uh, all India Institute of Technologies. Uh, universities should be without borders. So let's uh, university should lead the bureaucracy. We should lead the political parties, uh, and we should have the local collaboration so that 
Pakistan or India, ke tar, uh, we have same languages, same problems, uh, similar cultures. So how we can benefit from their you know, leadership in many areas like IT and uh, you know, innovation and all those things. So idea is that universities have to come out of their uh, present uh, bureaucratic power. And even vice-chancellors today, they are trying to become more powerful, more like a, a feudal uh, lords. Hum ek humble role models who uh, students ke liye or universities ka jo uh, uh, understandings is ko develop kare with civil society, bureaucracy ke saath, uh, parliament ke lo- ہمارےستان <laughs> They are our ambassadors and they are invited as guest speakers. I don't have professors, I have young uh, mid-career ke, uh, uh, teachers and, and faculty. So what I am dependent on is on the other people who are visiting uh, Gilgit Baltistan and other universities, and especially Alamaik Balopan University. With virtual university, we have a 6 billion US, uh, rupees uh, project, which is called District Headquarter Virtual University in Skardu. Uh, with Alamai Balopan University, we have the similar, uh, you know, uh, collaboration because GB is very difficult area to have campuses. IIT is an excellent example that you are a university without bricks and mortars and you can survive and you can deliver. So are the University of Baltistan that we can reach to the remotest and hardest uh, areas of Gilgit Baltistan online through distance education models of Alamai Balopan University. And these are the uh, challenges, but I think uh, one of the you know, uh, success stories that uh, poorest of the poor people of Gilgit Baltes are having the highest literacy and highest happiness index. Probably that is the ray of hope that how we channelize our uh, youth into new uh, employment and new universities. Uh, there should be a, a succession planning. Uh, elderly people should uh, prepare mid-career leaders so that we universities don't fee, uh, find the crisis once the vice chancellors or the senior management retires. And similar is the case that, you know, uh, last night we were all watching that parliament uh, house has been attacked or whatever. So, you know, our media is also wasting time and uh, diverting the uh, energies on, uh, you know, uh, pretty uh, small political activities. So the universities have to uh, jump in uh, they have, because you have the parents on your side. The parents of the students are on our side. So let's use them that uh, the agenda of Pakistani politics and Pakistani uh, you know, uh, policymakers uh, should be driven by the universities, by the youth. Uh, there was an awakening of present political government. There was a youth urge uh, in 2018. we should have uh, tried to make use of that because they wanted to take things in their own control. Probably last 60 years, our senior leadership was not able to uh, deliver. So it is the time that global uh, fraternity of youth should join hand. Uh, online students within Pakistan, abroad, they can uh, make uh, help each other moves and so many other things. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Ji. Thank you, Naeem Saab. Thank you. Look, I think uh, Naeem Saab has made a good point about Gilgit Baltistan and yes, collaboration is very important. But let me return to the subject. Um, um, uh, um, Hassan Shah says that sciences are doing well. Well, maybe. But I can tell you one thing. Social sciences, I know well. Public policy, I know well. I have tried to recruit social scientists and public policy professionals. And I can tell you there are none in Pakistan. Absolutely none. We can't find good people. Pakistan at all. What the universities are turning out is absolutely uh, sad, very sad. And I think we should all think about it. Secondly, our government does not turn to us, to you guys, for any public policy advice. Correct me if I'm wrong. Has the government ever asked you, approached you to do anything? The metro was made in Lahore, right outside UET, government college, everything. No institution was involved. 
When I asked the government, they said these guys are not capable of, of, of giving us anything. So I think either we have to work on our perception or we have to recognize that maybe people do not want us anything from us except to turn out poor quality graduate students. And I think this is a, something that we should face. So I'll turn to Jonathan Adelton from FC College. Jonathan Adelton has come from outside. So maybe Jonathan give, can give us a different perspective, a fresh perspective. Professor Adelton. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I guess I must say I was happy to have uh, Professor Hassan Shah on the screen as well. Uh, he's now at Foreman and I think uh, in the sciences certainly making uh, wonderful contributions. Uh, I may also have, if it's okay, a shout out to PIDE because back in the 1980s, when I was doing my own dissertation in the social sciences on the economic impact of uh, migration from Pakistan to the Middle East, PIDE uh, provided a home for me. Basically, that um, uh, that that dissertation, which became a book, was um, was done at PIDE, and I might say I relied very heavily for some um, the fabric of that dissertation on some of the masters MPhil anthropology papers that were being produced at Qadi Azam. Uh, one of their requirements, which I don't know if they would still have this, but basically the MPhil students would have to spend a certain period of time in a village and do a village report. And I arrived to Qadi Azam and I saw dozens of these in the, in the uh, bookshelf. And I thought, well, their advisors read them, the students that wrote them read them. I'm probably the third reader, um, but it was just wonderful because this was even, it wasn't the dissertation or the, the, the thesis wasn't necessarily about uh, migration to the Middle East. Um, but it was about village observation, and you could just tell that the dynamic was changing in Pakistan and that this particular event in the 1980s uh, was making a difference. So, yeah, that shout out to PIDE that at the time uh, provided a home and actually a resource, unexpected resource, which uh, really informed, uh, informed what I wrote. Um, for Foreman, I have been here a year, um, and uh, I, I, I think that um, I want to speak to the topic, which is the crisis in graduate education. But perhaps a little bit like Dr. Hassan Shah, I just wanted to put at least a, a little positive wrinkle. My first meeting uh, with the alumni when I came here was with Shaka Tareen, who was head of our alumni society before he became Minister of Science. And he took me aside and he basically said, Jonathan, the story of Foreman that I like so much is that it's a story of renewal. And if you think about Foreman College between 1970 and 2000, uh, during the nationalization phase, um, it had a lot of challenges. And of course, when it was, uh, uh, denationalized in the early 2000s, they had a lot of challenges as well. Um, that's about 20 years ago, and I think uh, anybody here on the screen is welcome to come visit us, um, but I think there has been a difference. Of course, we also got a university charter. Of course, it meant we also had graduate programs. And so this is about graduate education. So, um, you know, some of what we have is relatively new. We're making our way, um, but I think there are some positive things, and I guess this story, and you can appreciate the vice chancellors here, uh, when one of your alumni says, I like their story because it's a story of renewal, um, that's a very positive thing uh, from, my, from my perspective. Uh, when I've come, and I guess I would extend this to graduate uh, education as well, you know, people ask me, you know, Dr. Armacost did this for Foreman, Dr. Tebby did that, what is your emphasis? And I will say that the two things I've, um, I've, I've focused on in the first instance is one, um, international connections, and two, the quality of the institution. Um, so, you know, we've had building programs, we've had other things coming up, um, but I do think that this international connections plus the quality is, um, is hugely important. And I think in terms of addressing a crisis, if you will, I don't think that's a bad two things to, uh, uh, to focus on. Uh, another thing, and uh, this is maybe partly driven by the, this week, International Women's Day. I do think, I don't know how this would go across the board. I think the, uh, the news from Baltistan uh, and Gilgit was about the female engagement involvement. Um, we get a number of those students uh, down here at uh, university, and then they go other places perhaps for graduate programs. Um, but I think it's worth acknowledging that two thirds of our graduate students are female. And I don't know, I mean, some people in the US, the, uh, the, they say it's a crisis of males because um, of, the, of the, that dynamic that's taking place in terms of university education. I would be interested to know how that statistic, uh, nearly two thirds of our students in graduate school here at Foreman are female. Is that, um, uh, you know, is that more broadly across Pakistan? Uh, is that perceived as a good thing or a bad thing? Um, but again, I think it's an interesting statistic. And I might say that even in, the, um, uh, in terms of the faculty, well above 40% of our, of our faculty are female. Uh, again, I wonder if that's um, uh, universal across Pakistan, if that's a universal trend, if it's something more recent, if people would perceive that as positive or negative, uh, but it's something I've noticed. And I, I, I guess I will say, I mean, we have, it's a small dorm, but we've opened a, a dorm for female um, MPhil students. Maybe that helps. Uh, we've also opened a dormitory for, or we're going to, it hasn't finished yet, but it's a small 
and it's small, but it's basically a house for young female faculty that come from outside Lahore. And even in the year that I've been here, uh, there's been these requests about, I'm coming to Lahore to teach at Foreman, where am I gonna stay? Um, and these are recent graduates oftentimes, recent graduates from graduate school, MPhil PhD programs. And I think that's, uh, that's one thing we focused on. Again, I'd welcome comments, good, bad, and different. Um, what do people think? Uh, the, the final thing I'm going to say, um, and again, one of the things that uh, you mentioned for a new perspective, and I don't know how long this will last in terms of the, of the clash with reality, um, but we really are committed to having an experience for both our undergraduates and our graduate students outside the classroom. Um, so we, 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 it's interesting because how it fits into the program, even talking to the CFO, um, some of the engagements that we have, I say, just think of them, because some of these are in the social sciences, quite honestly. And, um, uh, you know, a, a lab in a science context is well understood. Uh, a lab in a non-science uh, context perhaps is more difficult. Uh, one of these is uh, our sociology department doing some work with brick, brick kiln workers, uh, which is pretty fascinating. Um, although trying to put the academic model to fund some of the things in the brick, with some of this outreach, if you will, is kind of tough. Um, I'm also thinking of some things I saw even this morning. We have our own lab school uh, for education department on site on campus. Uh, we're also developing a relationship with a, um, uh, with a special needs school, again, for the education department. Um, we're also uh, engaging on a, on a potential um, uh, community counseling center uh, that again, is in, it's, it's, it's the combination of our students, our grad students, uh, and dealing with realities of Pakistan. Uh, another one is actually a, um, uh, a women's empowerment, women's employment program where maybe the business school students could provide some um, marketing ideas and things like that. Um, I'm gonna close with this and, 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 and maybe this gets onto uh, some of the challenges, but I will say the bureaucracy, I've been here for a year, is unbelievable. This isn't the educational bureaucracy I'm talking about. Maybe people have conversations there, but this is just the bureaucracy. Our lab school uh, trying to build a second building to meet the accommodation of a, this is this is the lab school being up to grade 10, to have the, uh, the, the accommodation to have one, 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 uh, one building for guys and one, one building for females. You know, on the one hand, I'm constantly visited where are your two buildings. On the other hand, I've been struggling for a year for a permit. The last one is you only have spaces for six motorcycles to park. Anybody that's been to the, to the Foreman campus know we have spaces for 10,000 motorcycles, uh, but this was a change in desk officers. And suddenly, you know, I, 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 we were almost there. And then the latest news that my engineer says is, uh, you know, we have to do it. I, mean, I guess I'm going to be very blunt to this audience. Earlier, a few months ago, uh, the issue was, oh, you're six feet out in terms of the regulations here, but go ahead and sign. It's going to be okay. Um, and you can imagine, I, I can't go ahead and sign on a verbal thing on a statement that says, uh, that's checkable a few months later to say, oh, you're six feet out, tear the building down. So I'm voicing a, 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 a frustration. I don't know if you all have experienced it in similar, similar capacity, um, but this one is a tough for me. And again, it's, I'm not talking about the educational bureaucracy. I'm talking about the development authority bureaucracy or other kinds of bureaucracy. And I'm thinking here, this lab school is probably one of the 10% best schools in Pakistan. And we can't fulfill this requirement. In the meantime, people are knocking down my door saying, where's your second building? So there are frustrations. And I guess there's 67 people online right now. And I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn. And I, 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 I like to, I mean, I ended on that positive note from Shaka Turi and you guys are a story of renewal. I love that aspect of it. We need to renew our institutions, um, but it's tough. It's tough. And you guys have probably experienced that in spades, but this one, I'm just shaking my head and saying, really, does it really have to be this way? So thank you for giving me the few minutes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Hamilton. Thank you very much. Very nice to know, know that you were associated with the PID. We would welcome you to come back and visit us and uh, you know, spend some time with us, whatever, even if it's a few hours, we'll welcome you back, show you that it, what we've done at PID. Let me turn to Hassan Shah Saab, I'm going to come back to you. Let me turn to Professor Mohsen from IM Sciences. Professor Mohsen, please tell me, um, do you feel the crisis I do, or are you positive like Hassan Shah? Do you feel we've achieved something, or do you feel like me, a sense of despondency that the government, for example, cannot find a single social scientist or public policy analyst to work with them? The government can't get anything from the universities, and the government is crying out and saying, what, what is this? So are the universities there only for consumption, or are they going to give us something? Hassan Shah blames the economy. 
but I don't blame the economy when the universities can't give me a single public policy analyst or social scientist to hire. If you have any, please send them to me. I'd love to interview them. Right now, Hassan Shah, when I interview an economist who comes from your universities, I ask him a simple question like, do you know what the economist is? And they turn around and say, I don't. That worries me. Yesterday, there were two very senior PhDs who came to me and I asked them something like, okay, do you know of Dan Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize winner, a very famous guy who's written a very serious books, etc. We invited him for a webinar too. And they said, we don't. So I worry about it. It's Dr. Mohsen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadeem al -Haq. Uh, I think to answer your question right away, you hit the nail on the head. I agree with that. But mm. I also uh, tend to agree 60-70% with Dr. Hassan Shah uh, has just said. And uh, because I tend to be taking more uh, positive uh, view of things, uh, let me, I'll try to be uh, very brief because I know other speakers are in line on, uh, we are going through an evolution process. We all know that. Uh, let me talk to you about Peshawar. In, in the early 70s, uh, when I came to, uh, to school and then to college later on, there was one university in Peshawar, University of Peshawar. And the population was probably of the, of the entire province, uh, something around 11 uh, million or so. And uh, now the population has grown probably 35 to 40 million of the province. Peshawar University, which was one university, now it has been split into three other universities, Islamic College, Engineering University, Agriculture, and Peshawar University. When it was one university, the VC Saab was a real Saab. You know, everyone, even when I was not going to university in college, we knew who the VC was. There was no, you know, uh, media uh, as much as we have uh, exposure to that right now, television programs, etc. But we knew who the VC was. And when I was doing my bachelor's, uh, for some reason, I had to go to the VC's office and I was scared. How would I talk to this guy? And what will I say about my problem? So that was the type of, you know, image VC used to carry. And now you know how it is. So yes, things have gone down. But coming back to Hassan Shah Sahib, uh, I don't think they've gone down as much as uh, you have said, as much as you feel. Uh, a, sh a quick example I'll give you. Uh, three of our uh, teachers here, uh, they were not even professors. Uh, unfortunately, they got good jobs in outside the country and they left when their bond period was over. So uh, the potential is here. We need to uh, groom them and uh, change our way of uh, the way we teach, the way we handle our students. I'll also refer to a common phrase uh, here in uh, KPK. We used to say that we learn your, your basic education from your hujra and your masjid. Now both institutions are not the functioning the way they were. So there is no hujra. There is no uh, uh, mosque uh, the way it used to be uh, 40, 50 years ago, where basic learning was given of your uh, etiquettes, your ethics, and how to conduct yourself. So that is left to schools and colleges now, and universities, of course. Uh, the students that we get from uh, colleges, uh, we need to work a lot with them. The quality is not there except from good schools, or I would say the elite schools, Beacon House and City and others, uh, who are mostly in urban areas. We do get a lot of students from the rural areas. And I found them to be very smart. Once they start learning, they learn quick. They're quick, fast learners, but their basic education is not up to the mark that they would comfortably attend a university. Uh, but once we do things with them that we normally do here, and because we are a small university or institute, we get that advantage. Because we are in a fairly developed area uh, with some industry, some businesses around us. So we do have that advantage, which many universities in many areas, especially in rural areas, do not have. So uh, we get a lot of people from the industry here uh, to deliver lectures, to talk to students, and uh, to train them for the jobs that they're going to 
be applying for when they graduate. And also a big, uh, well, I would correct myself, not a big portion, but a reasonable, a reasonable significant portion of our students do have facilities here uh, for business incubation because we are primarily business school and uh, they are trained there initially. So they do start their own businesses or they join good companies. Uh, so that training uh, has improved since 2002, I would say. Uh, the higher education, many people don't agree, but personally, I do agree that the funding increased uh, at that time when higher education commission was uh, commissioned. And uh, they did a lot of good things also, although a lot of people are criticizing them now. Uh, we have a number of PhDs now who've come back from foreign countries, uh, who've gone there with a scholarship from the EHEC, uh, and they're doing good things here. Uh, for instance, one of my uh, assistant professors, uh, he's working with the government uh, in some projects on environment. He's done a lot of work on water conservation, water-related issues in uh, a university in Netherlands. So, and there are a few other cases like that also. So things I would say are not really that bad. They're going in the right direction. But like someone just said, we are going in that direction, but very, very slowly. And we have to gear up uh, because the students that we teach now, uh, let's say half of the students in my class, they are very challenging. Uh, they challenge us, they challenge the teacher uh, because they look at things that are available on the net, Coursera courses, et cetera, et cetera. Their friends living abroad doing things the way things are done there. So they ask those questions from the teachers and those teachers now who are much younger than uh, the, the age of teachers that we used to uh, uh, attend their classes, uh, I think that has changed. Uh, what we do here is that we ask the teachers to be uh, more friendly with the students, not friends, but friendly, uh, do more interaction with them. We have a number of student societies here uh, working in environment and drama and different things. Uh, one thing that I agree with you, yes, the quality of research uh, uh, is not up to the mark at all. Uh, and a lot of work needs to be done there. But as you uh, may have uh, seen or known that HEC is working on that now, a lot of journals have been downgraded. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do need to sit together and work on that area, how our research becomes more practical, uh, more value uh, added. Uh, that's one area that I think we uh, need to work on. And uh, uh, the last thing that I would like to comment on that you said the government is not uh, asking universities uh, for help. Uh, in our situation here, I would just not to uh, praise myself, but uh, the government here uh, is asking uh, professors on various committees. For, like, for example, I'm on about four uh, public sector organizations of the government. Uh, in energy in, uh, on their boards, in energy and in, uh, investment and industry uh, and IT technology, where we contribute what we can uh, to the government uh, towards the development of those uh, public sector organizations. So it has started now. And once if we are able to deliver and come up to the government expectations, uh, uh, like Dr. Hassan Shah said, there is some improvement. And I'm very, very hopeful that, uh, you know, we'll be able to work uh, as a university, like in other developed countries, uh, contribute to the society and to the government and produce, I would hate the word produce, uh, but develop good citizens of the society who can contribute positively. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohsen. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that you are being consulted in... Uh, in the province, but quite frankly, um, I can't wait to hear from others whether they are being consulted or not. Uh, the situation, at least in the Federation and Punjab, to my mind, seems uh, very bad. And the crisis of professionals you have to face. I mean, this business of giving people PhDs and a false hope that they can get a job, I think we are trying to duck that a little bit. I'll come to Hassan Shah on that, but let me take Dr. Zeul Kayum from 
uh, AIOU University. Thank you very much, Professor Nadeem. Um, uh, I mean, allow me if uh, I say something which doesn't really sound, uh, I mean, as expected, uh, I'll be talking uh, uh, something which probably we, most of us do not like to listen to. Um, and very frankly, I mean, at the outset, I can say, yes, there is a need lots of, for lots of improvement. I mean, if you talk about academics, if you talk about research and the type of research the universities are actually engaged in, yes, we, we need to really further improve it. There's no doubt about it. But let's see to the other side of the uh, story as well. Let's, let's hear that story as well. Uh, I mean, if I uh, see the universities, I'll be talking about academics research separately. And I talk about academics first. And uh, I mean, you could be, I mean, a person who knows the two sides of the story anyway, better than any one of us. Uh, you headed the planning commission of Pakistan as well, uh, and have served uh, at reputed international institutions as well, and now serving Pakistan, uh, Pakistan institutions as well. I mean, what is the basic ingredient when we talk about the quality academics or the, I mean, the universities to produce quality graduates? The foremost and the most important thing is the faculty members, the qualified faculty members. Now, start with the year 2003, maybe. I mean, I have served this uh, profession for about 32 years and I've seen universities struggling to pay their utility bills as well. What to talk of faculty members anyway? We can only see, I mean, a kind of uh, support, not exactly the support, they tried to support, the government tried to support the higher education sector of Pakistan uh, when we, anyway, uh, somehow or other established this higher education commission of Pakistan and some money started coming to the higher education sector of Pakistan. Faculty development programs were initiated. We are talking about lack of professors in the universities. We are talking about I talk about lack of faculty members in the universities. I mean, what to talk of having professors? And then when we have lack of faculty members, who was to be really responsible for? Who was to be blamed for? The policymakers, the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan. Although Higher Education, of Commission of, uh, Higher Education Commission did contribute to raise the level of uh, the count of faculty members in the universities, we are far better than where we were in year 2002 or in 2010. But the point is we were having 53 universities in year 2001 or year 2002, and now we have more than 200 universities. Whatever uh, the count we could raise in terms of uh, having qualified faculty members, for a moment, let's keep aside the, the, their potential and quality of research they produce. At least we had faculty members who can teach at the higher education sector institutions. Um, the number of universities increased uh, actually uh, at an exponential rate, whereas the faculty development could not really match that progress. So whatever we could invest in faculty development could not meet the needs of the universities to have the faculty members to teach and produce the quality graduates anyway. And resultantly, whatever we could in the universities, we have a pressure anyway, we like it or not, we are at the at one moment also ignoring th almost 3,000 affiliated colleges with these universities who are offering undergraduate education. And we are talking about only universities. Anyway, the universities are in a better position to, to actually impart quality education. But now talk about these 3,000 affiliated colleges, which have to be affiliated by the public sector universities because they are the government colleges and the government as per policy, you like this word or not, but as per their own policy, it was not consulted with actually the, the, the stakeholders. It was prepared in isolation anyway, and undergraduate degree programs, or programs were started in these affiliated colleges who otherwise do not have enough faculty members to actually teach at their FA level or to, at the BA level even. I, had it, uh, I, I served as vice chancellor of Gujarat University and I know, I mean, how I actually could deal with these affiliated colleges, always strikes and, and challenges because they have their own culture. So this is one side of the story where we actually lack any anyway faculty, qualified faculty to actually deal with this influx of students. 
there is a challenge anyway. More and more students want to really get into this higher education. The government have their own priorities. There is a disconnect at the basic level where we are actually making decisions at the policy level on critical reasons. It's not really merely the need of the country. If I ask someone what is the need of the country for next 10 years, maybe how many engineers do we need? How many medical scientists do we need? How many social scientists do we need? Do we have the data? No. The university's policies morally more are actually are, are actually more dependent on the fact how to deal with the deficit they are actually uh, being faced with. And that's why they try to increase their income somehow, and then obviously compromising on certain other things, which results into obviously, uh, la I mean, uh, uh, degrading the quality of education. And when you talk about this quality of education, it's a relative term, a qualitative term in a way. Uh, I mean, <laughs> let's face the realities. I was actually, um, I mean, arguing with a colleague in HEC a few years ago, and I said, um, I mean, let's uh, think about a general university where one fact member is bound to teach minimum of nine to 12 credit hours. And the 70% time of that faculty member in a university is consumed uh, in, in teaching. Whereas in few of the universities, we call them those universities elite universities, professor takes only one course maybe, and even half of the course even. So there's a disparity when we talk about academics. My, I mean, if I conclude this part, of, uh, I mean, uh, the discussion, I say, the policymakers really failed to match the needs of the quality faculty members uh, matched with the pace of the development, so-called development we, we saw in, increase, in increasing the number of universities. And you rightly pointed out, even now, no one is asking anybody, should we really uh, establish new universities? Whether we really need it? Nobody is asking us. But we are actually criticized as, as a sector and segment well, the universities are not producing good graduates. So they, 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 there's a disconnect. And I strongly emphasize that we need to really, I mean, focus on to the faculty development and strengthening, strengthening the faculty resource base, which anyway requires money, which anyway requires funds to fund the universities, whatever faculty at the moment they have and produce new faculty members qualified from all around the world. And by the way, out of almost 2,000 uh, uh, PhDs who actually graduated from different parts of the world, uh, almost 70% of the faculty members have, have completed their PhDs from advanced countries of the world, starting with US, UK, France, Germany, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Very few from uh, European countries, uh, I mean, rest of the Europe. Talking to the research about research very quickly, I'm sorry I'm taking time, Professor Naveen. Um, I agree, yes, uh, we, we, since we have a disconnect um, with the industry, we, we have a disconnect with the, the policymakers, whatever faculty members do as part of their responsibility producing research papers is merely to complete their own majority of the teachers. I mean, I'm not really criticizing all of them, but we normally produce research because we have to complete certain requirements uh, laid down uh, in our job descriptions anyway, and to get really, uh, to, uh, to reach to the ranks of maybe professors or associate professors, et cetera, et cetera. Because the evaluation system of the country merely relies on this count only. I have been talking to HEC colleagues since last about seven years, let's review the faculty hiring and promotion criteria. But they have their own priorities. Nobody listens to it. We are already always talking about challenges, but nobody mostly actually tries to become part of the solution anyway. And even those who are at the helm of affairs at, at, in different offices. Um, and this research obviously is then uh, some, some or other uh, uh, related to uh, the fact that we do not have adequate number of faculty members uh, in the universities or to talk about lesser number of professors um, because the, this, this, these new universities basically then, whosoever is paying better incentives to the faculty members, they, uh, the faculty members switch to the new institutions and that's it. We have that same pool, which is actually catering to the needs of 220 universities, which we have, I mean, a year ago, maybe um, 170 or so. Um, 
And very briefly about the wage factor, I mean, although Professor Hassan also mentioned about it, and your good self, you, you are an economist and I cannot really, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a technologist, I cannot really comment on it, but I know colleagues in the science domain, why the companies, I, I'm talking about my own domain only, why the companies would like to hire computing professionals in Pakistan, uh, outsourcing their, their, their computing needs or the programmers, I mean, if they, they require programmers, they are actually using uh, people or graduates from within the country. I'm not actually going to praise, but I know, I mean, my, my two boys, they graduated from Pakistani universities and uh, the Pakistani industry were offering them maybe 70,000, 80,000, as you pointed out. And the same graduate, uh, uh, was hired by a company in UK paying him 2,000 pounds. And the other got the same graduate with the same level of skills, got uh, actually an offer from a company in Dubai, a US-based company, and getting $1,700. So it's not merely, I mean, when, when we are evaluating, yes, we should evaluate with the rationale. It's not only the quality of the graduates. Yes, there are challenges. I, I should mention it. But it is the state of affairs in the country as well, where their potential is being actually, they, 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 they are used because they know they can get it. Nobody is watching it. There is no legislation. There is no state support which could determine the minimum wage level anyway. So the, there are multiple factors uh, when we talk about employability of the graduates. And finally, Professor Naveem, I'm a passionate educationist who, who had served this profession for about 32, 33 years. And I, I remain in this country. I've tried to serve this profession with, I mean, and, and, and I do it uh, for a cause. But honestly, we live in a society and these universities do not operate in isolation when we talk about the country and society. Whatever is happening around us has an impact and effect on the culture and state of affairs in the universities, and the universities are a reflection of whatever we see in, in our country, unfortunately, and about the regulators as well. What's happening, I, I won't talk about it in Higher Education Commission, but everybody and every one of us knows what has happened there. So thank you very much for providing me opportunity to really, I mean, vent me <laughs> myself out, but I'll be happy to really further say anything if there is a question. Thank you. Thank you, Gayum Saab. I think very well said, there's a disconnect in many parts of the university system. There's a disconnect between the education ministry and the HEC, which is very well illustrated. Disconnect between the prime minister's office and elsewhere, very well seen recently. There's a disconnect between the universities themselves and the universities and the HECs too. I'm afraid the word disconnect can be widely used. For example, you mentioned a number of things, policy. Yes, when I was in the planning commission, I tried my best to stop the brick and mortar game. But at each time, the HEC, the Prime Minister, everybody would say, no, we want more universities. Now they are talking about a university in every district. I, I say, why not put a university in every bathroom? Why not put a university in every kitchen? Do we have any analysis of how many universities we need? Now, whose fault is it, Hasan Shah Sab? I'm coming back to you. Should the universities play a role in any debate? Or are universities mainly teaching colleges? What have the universities contributed to any debate in this country? And I would, work, I would argue almost zilch. And so when you tell me there's research, I don't buy it. There has been a 10 trillion rupee loss in the energy sector over the last 15 years. A 10 trillion rupee energy loss. Has the university written anything on it? This morning, there was an article in the papers, PIE is bleeding to the tune of 50 billion rupees this year and almost every year. Has the university written anything on this? So, I mean, you know, it's okay. You tell me there might be a few physics papers. Okay, I'll buy that. I won't argue. But in the larger area of the country is working, Hassan Shah Saab, universities have produced nothing. There's a crisis, a political crisis in the country right now. Universities don't have any research. So if the universities don't give anything, Kayum Saab is right in saying we live in the society, but universities are supposed to lead the society. So the university is just a bunch of teachers who just take their wages and run around doing nothing. 
or are they going to contribute something ji i'll come back to you kayum sir sir sirf ek sentence kehna with your permission i'm sorry main sirf ek baat keh dun ki jo aap farma rahe hain i mean you are saying it right that uh, the university should play a role but these are the facts when i talk about society there are things which i cannot say publicly but i'm saying it one thing the vice chancellor has to stay in fia headquarters for one day just for nothing so these are hard realities as well let's face it fair point but yet the university i think uh, nadeem the thing is that all of this is true like uh, some good things are happening yes sir unhone kisi ka naam bhi kar system mein rakha things are also happening which uh, and i think uh, dr arilton and dr zia uh, have uh, touched upon the fact of uh, you know the bureaucratic uh, opposition that universities face especially public sector universities i have often said that the higher education department is the biggest impediment to uh, higher education in punjab at least they make life difficult they do not uh, papers don't move and when charters are made when uh, uh, you know charters which are uh, which govern us there is no consultation which takes place with the universities um, somebody decides to make a, a change in the charter the, it is done in the by the by the government and the chief minister in consultation with the uh, higher education department or whichever administrative department is looking after the university but the universities are never taken on board the charters are i think need to be drastically uh redrawn or uh, you know uh, modified to suit the needs of uh, of the universities of today that is not being done why should we have one chancellor for 50 punjab universities or 60 punjab universities why what is the role of that one chancellor why should we all be rooted through the higher education department i mean these are all real life issues you're talking about why don't we write anything on on certain issues maybe people you know we are all bound in our own subject souls i know that as a physicist uh there is no industry in pakistan with whom i can go to talk there is no industry which comes to me so i mean the general problem of the economy of the lack of the manufacturing sector hits all the, the science departments it may hit the engineering uh, uh, departments also in universities abroad you see the industry coming in to fund research they tell you what research to do and uh, they get that research done out of universities has the government ever come to a university to say uh, your economists or your uh, you know the relevant department should make a comment here is some money do a research project on the environment or on the you know energy crisis or whatever nobody comes the government doesn't come because they, they the bureaucracy is there to look after everything they are the know alls they provide all the answers to the government and everybody else is equal to zero they they teach, uh, treat the universities uh, with a lot of uh, i don't know hakarat ko angrezi mein kya kahenge they they are not uh, uh, universities are not valued i think this name uh, i think by the uh, by the bureaucracy so universities may be open to get votes or to make money if it's a private sector university mostly but uh, our is society is the government are the politicians is the bureaucracy uh, giving us that place in society that a university ought to have i don't think so why are we being managed by all these people university is supposed to be autonomous but you talk to any public sector university by chance so dr zia is sitting here in front of us ask him dr uh, naim is here <laughs> are you autonomous sir i didn't feel particularly autonomous when i was vice chancellor of the government college university and uh, and that is the problem with our charters that is the problem with the so called managers who are who been self appointed we have been doing this since the time of the british they managed us they wanted teaching colleges they didn't want to have research done in our universities even when calcutta and bombay were open they said i think it was macaulay who said i heard somebody the other day saying teach them we need babus we don't need anything else coming out of these universities and i'm afraid that is the spirit which has not left left us even today so the problem is not merely in the universities i'm not saying that it's all hunky dory in the universities we have lot of issues lot of problems i think we are highlighting many of these but the general attitude wo jo colonial mentality which has been left behind that is not leaving us at all and i think uh, 
rather than addressing the universities only i think you should uh, take up as uh, you've been uh, in charge of the planning commission you're sitting in pipe you're an economist why don't you uh, why doesn't the government take it up with the bureaucracy how to deal with the universities why don't they consult the universities on how to deal with the universities this is all done somewhere above and the universities are at the receiving end of those set of rules there is now a, a policy in the punjab uh, public sector universities the criteria for hiring who the hell is a bureaucrat to tell me what is the criteria for hiring a professor or an assistant professor why is he managing why is he telling me to do things in a uh, similar uh, in a particular way so these are the issues that we face and i think as we talk about our research outputs our good research our poor research or whatever research we do i think these issues need to be dealt with immediately and that is the real crisis which is facing the university rather than what is being done or not done in the university thank you then there is a fundamental problem like for example when we try and raise some research or some ideas on this subject look at the attendance of the vice chancellor and the professors we keep blaming everybody else this is a standard thing in pakistan we blame the other person yes i know the civil service is is has a lot of problems and yes you've seen we've written a lot of things in the civil service we've conducted a lot of dialogue in the civil service we actually held a conference on the subject agreed why aren't you guys doing it why aren't you guys joining in the dialogue when i call a university and i have done this many times shah sab including your university when i call government college university or punjab university or whatever and i say hey, we want to hold a i think i have always been there wherever no, no, i think it's all you first time you not called me ji i'm not, not, I'm not I, talking about i'm not talking about I, you so i think no. you've gone now shah ji you've gone now the point is there, I, mean, there are different individuals people react differently everybody will not uh, uh, react uh, respond to you some people think differently i think that is not but as people since we are now sitting here debating these things i think we should try to really try focus on what are the one two or three major malaises which are hitting our universities okay why don't we do it why doesn't he do it let me come to that let me come to people who are in charge of this country they are the ones who should be made to understand what a university is all about and how to set things right in the universities and that can nobody has a perfect answer that can only be done in consultation with the stakeholders not that i go and write a newspaper article on something or the other it has no effect you write many articles it has no effect on anyone so uh, it is always the onus is on the ruling clique elite whatever you would like to call it and if they are serious about universities which from time to time we see that there is an interest in universities like when the hcc was made uh, 20 years ago there seemed uh, universities were uh, i think injected with a new life and and uh, things started happening things started moving okay but then our friends the the dmgs and these no alls all came in to tell us how to do it okay so they, they, they made charters which are uh, which are okay. terrible in the, in a syndicate meeting in many new universities the minister education minister chairs those meetings what does the engineer uh, education minister know about the syndicate of a university or what the problems are which the university is facing so i mean the problems are not only ours if they are they are general thank you thank you shaji but the point is i will still come back to that shaji let me see i'll bring in some other people now i'll still come back to this subject the education minister chairs the meeting because he has no respect for universities the dmg now wants to change the syndicate law because they have no respect for universities yes we can blame them all but universities have to earn the respect too and you have to earn the respect by doing something you can't earn the respect by just saying hey blame them blame them i have been to university shaji please i'm not talking about you at all i'm not talking about anybody at all i've been to university as a vice chancellor behaves like a king i've been to vice chancellor houses that are like mansions i've been to vice chancellor houses that are like the white house i've been to the vice chancellor having a protocol of 10 people i've been to the to universities where i talk i talk to a lot of university shaji as you know i'm a nosy parker i talk to a lot of universities i call the university and i say i want to arrange a conference and he says i have to ask the vice chancellor 
why the hell do you have to ask the vice chancellor? At PID, I've told everybody they are in the vice chancellor mentality. And I tell them, look, if you ask me. Look, Team, this is I'm, another issue is how vice chancellors are chosen. Hang on, hang on. Shadi, Shadi, now it's my turn. You can come later. There are other people in here, right? So the point is, we have to clean up our house too. Why are our universities not holding conferences and webinars? Why are our universities not giving us something on the charter? On the charter of the university, I agree with you entirely. Where is one single paper that the university has done on this? Why are the universities not doing research on HEC? I think these are issues that we should talk about. We can't just blame everybody else and be uh, serious. Naeem Saab, go ahead. Professor Naeem Saab. Naeem Saab, you have to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. All right. Uh, it is said that you know uh, universities are the islands of uh, knowledge in a sea of darkness. So what we do is, uh, you know, 2005, Pakistan signed a WTO, and that says that free flow of goods and services. So probably time has come that we should advertise the faculty worldwide. Let's have the competition. Let's have the applicants coming from Europe, from Far East, and let's compete. Because our forefathers in 1930s and uh, 20s, they went to UK for higher education and they uh, created a new state of Pakistan. Otherwise, if it was left without Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, our uh, madrasas had no solutions. So even today, I think we should go back to that uh, global, not the foreign faculty as HEC is doing, but actually competition for every advertisement of the faculty we should hire uh, from all across the globe. Uh, and that is the requirement of WTO. Second is we should have a bridge of integration between Madaris because they are producing millions of, uh, you know, Malvis who need IT education, some economics, uh, some uh, science. And similarly, there should be a dialogue between Madaris and the universities. And they should come to the universities to teach us some sort of uh, basic religion, and that sort of a marriage between these two extremes. And the third is, you know, uh, I went to one of the universities in Spain. It's a, a linear model, leadership, entrepreneurship, and innovation. It's a four years degree program like a BBA, and not a single day in class. The day one, what they do is they uh, make a group of five to six people and ask them to make companies, launch a company, register a company, uh, either in IT or in software or in economics or whatever you want to do, and do the real business. And only the, there are guides. Uh, in Mandragon, you see, what they do is they take them to uh, you know, China for one semester at their own expenses and to India in Hyderabad for one semester. Idea is that after four years of successful businesses, these guys are awarded a BBA degree without courses, without. So we have to expand that practical part. We do have internships, five months internship, six months internship. I think we should translate it into a 99% uh, you know, practical field, industry level uh, learning, and maybe 5% self-teaching or uh, you know, uh, lectures and all that thing. So this is what uh, I, I, I would say that uh, you know, this uh, confusion of uh, educational policies, every day we are confusing the youngsters that uh, Urdu should be our medium of instructions. Uh, my apologies to Alamai uh, Balopan University Vice Chancellor. He is also the Vice Chancellor of uh, Urdu Science University. It has a mandate that everything will be converted into Urdu, and this, you know, and single national curriculum, which is killing our curiosity and creativity. Why don't you let the universities adopt whatever they want to do? Let there be uh, different types of colors and flowers, and all that uh, diversity. That is the natural flow, and we are, you know, converting and fixing the universities into a, a sort of a imposed curriculum uh, to make them sort of a Pakistanis who are. Uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, in the name of Islam or whatever, but we are not an open society, open to the West, open to the criticism, open to the minorities, open to the values of the environment and uh, global democracy and all that sort of thing. So that sort of, you know, openness has to come in our society and probably FC College is one and there are a few other, uh, you know, where we have the uh, liberal arts and government college, Lahore is one, but most of the universities, they don't exercise that sort of autonomy. I was the registrar of Punjab University from 2005 to 2010. Not a single day I visited Secretary of the Education Department. Not a single day I visited the uh, Minister of Higher Education in, in Punjab. They used to come. So it is the uh, authority and autonomy to be exercised by the registrars, by the vice chancellors, 
by the management you have been given sufficient uh, autonomy and that i am doing again in uh, in pakistan his excellency the president of pakistan has never interfered so i am having a 100% independence autonomy and only thing i consult is my colleagues over there and we have our community so that sort of you know uh, i say globalization uh, and within pakistan that's bring uh, bridge, build the bridges between our uh, traditional urdu uh, schools madrasa madaris schools and modern uh, english schools and let's have a peaceful society otherwise we'll have the issues like uh, darnas in faizabad and sialkot uh, incidents because we are all the part universities have to bridge the societies and bring the sections together thank you very much sir thank you ji let me bring in some people from the floor mansoor malik sahab mansoor Can malik you, yeah okay I am engineer Mansoor Malik. Uh, I am the founding VG of the NAS new campus in Islamabad. My one or two points only. One is uh, what uh, my friend and colleague Dr. Nadim said about Metro Lahore. You could buy the bloody junk buses and the, build the roads, but the entire software, IT structure, hardware integration was done by the IT University. next to the startup of the metro law i wanted to clarify the it university's contribution in setting up the complete hardware software integration the ticketing and everything to go with it and management so the it and the knowledge attached to the metro law came from one university that is my one point my second point is we are missing the topic actually you know we've gone hey while right from adrasa to this and to that we were talking about graduate students and their problems in my 10 year stay in nast i did some database when i was leaving nast for a think tank heading a think tank political university education policy so when i was leaving nast i did some some data in 10 years the outstanding students graduate students i'm talking now this is the university which is top 200 in asia and perhaps top 300 in the world out of 10 years graduate students that graduated out of nast we could not capture even 5% of the outstanding graduate students despite my best efforts in giving them research assistant scholarships technology scholarships i'm an engineer i'm talking about science and technology all of them were going abroad so we have not touched upon this thing regardless we have good teachers or bad teachers regardless we have open university or closed university regardless whether we have 20 feet wall or 1 foot wall of universities there would always be students who would be outstanding in every class whether you sit in a in a tart school or you say sit in an english public school whether you have a teacher or not the outstanding students are in every batch in every class what are we doing with them we are sending them abroad sorry you go to silicon valley it's fill up nas graduates it's fill up filled up with fast graduates we may not be contributing to our knowledge economy but we are doing it for european space agency we are doing it for nasa we are doing it so how do we capture these graduate students who are outstanding 3.5 to 4 that was my challenge when i was 10 years head of the nas campus in islamabad i could not capture more than 5% this is the real problem that we should be discussing today how do we you know what kind of a market we can give them if a third division or a second division a university graduate goes to the market what can he deliver a top notch graduate students are already abroad they be, even before their convocation they've lined up scholarships research scholarships ps masters phd scholarships abroad so that is the main problem we have not hit the nail and i'm totally agree with shaji i think uh, with hasan shah and i'm a ravian myself we need to look at the science technology universities in a totally different perspective than the social sciences because they're two poles apart snt if you look at we are contributing enough both here and abroad with our outstanding students getting in living uh, for you know prosperity shores abroad and there is hardly any university i have visited more than 100 universities of europe america you know when i was 10 years at the helm of a face setting up the state of the art nas university 
and everywhere I've been, our top notch students have been there. You know, I'm talking about science and technology. How do we get them back? That is our issue. How do we retain top graduate students from our universities? That is a major issue that is, nobody has discussed. We have so many problems. Yes, Mansoor sir, Mansoor sir, we have written about it many times in the PID. Sadly, sadly, academia does not read. Ye jo bar bar hum dusron ko blame karte hain, hamari academia padhti kyon nahi? Hamari academia yahan char chizhe chhapti hain, wo bhi nahi padhti. Hamari academia, we pretend as if we are doing a lot of research. Unfortunately, no. Yes, there is a brain drain from the country. And yes, we've written about it a number of times. And yes, we've tried to create a debate on it. But what I'm arguing about is that our academia is absolutely sitting in silos and focused only on teaching. There is very little interest in research. There is very little interest in ideas. We just talk about them when we need to talk about them. But in terms of reading, understanding what the literature is, we have very little. You may be right about science and technology. I don't know enough about it, but I don't see the, the impact of science and technology in the country. Public policy, social sciences, we failed miserably. And maybe it is because of our science bias. But right now, public, public policy and social sciences are so bad. We might as well close them down and make every university um, science and technology. And then let's see what will happen. Because we have no policy making skills. There is no policy being made anywhere. The policy is being made by donors and all our bureaucrats do a sign on it. Or bad laws are made, like the university law that's been made, that was made because the academia was sleeping. Or the or the fact that we have a tax administration reform program that's going for $400 million because the academia is sleeping. There are so many things that are happening in this country which the academia knows nothing about. For example, energy. There's a $150 million energy project that is producing everything on energy that does not include a single university in it because they think, they tell me that the university is not competent to work with them. Uh, let me point out, uh, let, just give me a minute. You know, there is a center of excellence on energy at NASP. We, we set it up and they are doing original research work. So there are silos, you know, in research. I, please, you can't have a, a sweeping statement for all universities. Mansoor sahab, Mansoor sahab, there are centers of energy in many places, not just in Silo, I think in Peshawar, and I think one in Sindh too. But those centers, centers of energy that was made by USAID funding do nothing. They're actually really not contributing anything. If I look at the center of energy, which I have looked at the center of energy in NAST, it has nothing to say about the circular debt. It has nothing to say about our problem. It may be working on some strange energy problems of the world. Maybe, maybe. I'm not saying it isn't. But as far as we are concerned, it is giving us nothing, unfortunately. And let's call a spade a spade. Let's not be defensive. Let's be, uh, let's be no, honest. Question, uh, my, my only question is G that G circular debt is a, is, a, is a economic and social issue. I'm talking about technology and I'm talking about technology development and technology uh, you know, solutions okay. for Fair our enough. technology pro uh, problems. G so G so G that's G what I'm saying. Thank agreed, you. agreed. I think science and technology is doing very well. I don't know why it's not showing up in the in the in the economy, but it's doing very well. Uh, sir, thank you very much uh, for holding this uh, second time. And uh, throwing good money at some bad idea does not mean problem will go away. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, the ideas perceived in 2000 for 1980 model education system is not going to work in 22, uh, 2022. So I think instead of universities providing solutions for the society, universities are stuck up in managing their own affairs. That's that's really sad story. And uh, main reason for this is that we don't we are not ready for any fresh thinking. We are basically I I remember here Dr. A R Kamal. Dr. A R Kamal in 2003 told us that these PhDs will serve in schools the way we are going to produce them. And I remember your statement in 2007 in one of the class that from the bottom 25% of the quartile of Gaussian distribution faculty will produce all those at the bottom. And now after 15 years, after 20 years, we are getting similar results. I think we need to think afresh. We have to uh, we can solve these uh, economic problems as uh, uh, one of my very senior uh, 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 vice chancellor, Dr. Ziaul uh, Kiyom is sitting here and uh, uh, Alama Iqbal Open University, virtual university can play very effective role. We are, uh, I am from Kaidal University 
we have 100 sections taking english course of 100 different qualities why can't we have one virtual course and we can save huge amount of money and in this way we need to think afresh in post pandemic if we keep on talking about that 2002 system is excellent everything is going fine whosoever will talk about that uh, uh, that's 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 not acceptable that whosoever will talk against that idea or will ask about fresh thinking that's not accept i think that will not us, uh, that will not lead us anywhere so my question from my vice chancellor is that okay how we can come out of this misaligned incentive system which was created two decades back that's that's main my question and if we can okay. solve this Great. i think we we we, we can overcome let things. me take one more question i'll come back to the vice chancellor ji hina hina asan assalam alaikum sir ji sir me i am hina asan research economist from pi Uh, this is this is this is a very important topic that need to be addressed or highlight ji sir jahan baat kar rahe graduate unemployment ki wahan pe hame mismatch of education ko bhi dekhna chahiye aur unfortunately pakistan mein jo hai wo miss over education jo graduates ki bahut zyada ho rahi hai yani ki 16 year of education karke log jo hai 10 year ki jo hai wo matric level ka padha rahe hain jahan pe jo hai wo 10 year education requirement hai isi tarah se agar hum by discipline dekhe तो डॉक्टर्स और इंजीनियर्स बन के अगर एक कल्चर सेक्टर में काम कर रहे हैं या कंपेंसी की जॉब कर रहे हैं तो वाई वी हैव प्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर्स एंड इंजीनियर क्योंकि इसकी आपकी एक हैवी कोस्ट आपको ना सिर्फ पब्लिक और प्राइवेट कोस्ट बेयर करनी पड़ रही है सेकेंड सर जब हम बात करते हैं क्वालिटी ऑफ एजुकेशन की तो अगर एक ही यूनिवर्सिटी में से चार लोगों को एक अच्छी जॉब मिल रही है और दो लोगों को एक अच्छी जॉब नहीं मिल रही है तो इट डजेंट उनकी क्वालिटी का इशू है हमारे पास डिमांड भी उसका क्रिएट नहीं हो रही यानी कि हम देखें कि टेलीकॉम इंडस्ट्री में हमारे पास जो है वो डाउनफॉल आ गया है बट स्टिल यूनिवर्सिटी जो है वो टेलीकॉम इंजीनियर प्रोड्यूस कर रहे हैं जो कि पहले ही अनएम्प्लॉयड है तो हम जो है वो सिर्फ एक अर्निंग के लिए लोगों को क्यों प्रोड्यूस कर रहे हैं जब उसकी डिमांड नहीं है और अगर हम सब देखें हम यूनिवर्सिटी इंडस्ट्री लिंकिंग इंडेक्स में तो हम इंडिया से अपनी नेबरिंग कंट्री से ही बहुत पीछे हैं तो क्यों नहीं हम इसके ऊपर फोकस करते हैं कि क्या इंडस्ट्री में किस चीज की डिमांड है क्यों हम उसके मुताबिक नहीं हम ग्रेजुएट्स को प्रोड्यूस करते हैं क्यों हम अपनी यूनिवर्सिटीज में इंडस्ट्रीज को कहें कि आके वो इंटर्नशिप ऑफर करें ट्रेनिंग्स ऑफर करें वर्कशॉप्स क्यों नहीं देते हैं हम उनको क्यों हम जॉब फेयर नहीं रखते हैं ताकि हमारे पास जो है वो अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट के साथ साथ जो एक मिस बैच ऑफ एजुकेशन इंक्रीज होती जा रही है उसको भी हम रिड्यूस कर सकें कंट्री आई मीन दिस अनदर टॉपिक वे वी कैन सम अदर एट सम अदर पॉइंट मे टॉक अबाउट विद रिगार्ड्स टू प्रिपरेशन ऑफ द कोर्सेस डॉक्टर दीन दिस इज अगेन समथिंग व्हिच रिलेट्स टू द पॉलिसी मैटर्स एज़ वेल आई एम द पर्सन हु हैड बीन टॉकिंग अबाउट हैविंग अ क्वालिटी अश्योरेंस फ्रेमवर्क फॉर ओपन डिस्टेंस लर्निंग सिंस लास्ट अबाउट 4 इयर्स वेल बिफोर कोविड एक्चुअली फेल ऑफ एंड नोबडी लिसन टू मी I ask that I'll, I'll invite experts from around the world. HTC may take the lead, and let's prepare the policy how these programs are to be offered, which actually metric is to be used to really design the courses. What I mean to to really accredit the courses, etc., etc. And nobody listened to me. Um, and then we had this COVID, and with regards to a, a, a suggestion given by one of my colleagues from Kerala University, I have always been saying again an economic uh, factor. I mean the factor of economics and uh, uh, the, the the financial challenges. I, I should say, I have been saying that let's prepare MOOCs of maybe Pakistan, design, get best of the best teacher from within Pakistan or around from around the world, and to start with. let's develop the courses in the humanities domain the courses which are to be be enrolled by every student pakistan study the faculty may be given an ip share as well um, but nobody listen to me it's only recent 
currently, Dr. Nadeem, HEC has a project they are going to do with the World Bank support. Whereas support, and we were not asking for any money. I don't know whether the pe people who are at the hem of affairs are already connected with these agencies, maybe, and they only like to talk to the World Bank or maybe other donor agencies for petty things which the universities can do. It's not only the universities to be blamed. I'm giving you two examples. Three, the higher education management information system. I proposed it that let's develop it indigenous within the country uh, by pooling the resources. We take the lead as experts in the domain and let's prepare uh, what they call now as higher education development platform. They abandon idea. I emphasized it, let's do it. So it's not only, I mean, one, one, it's not, the universities are not ready. It's actually the problem is we can't make the policymakers understand and agree that, I mean, we, we are ready to really help you and contribute towards uh, solving the problems we have. So these were actually two, two uh, I mean, things we, I, I wanted to say with, uh, with regards to the questions raised. Uh, sorry, thank you, Kayum Sab. Bilkul ka apne, but dekhiye. my point is very simple. At the policy table, they have no respect for universities. Now, this is a challenge, and we have to face it. They've made the governor the chancellor because they have no respect for you. And they feel that you are there only for the political purpose of making graduates. In fact, they don't even care about graduates. They want the youth to be in a place so that they can't riot. And that's the only service that we are providing to them. So let's be serious ourselves. Secondly, if we don't take ourselves seriously, most of the campuses, we are doing a study with satellite data. We are looking at the number of houses on university campuses and the vice chancellor houses. And you'd be surprised, these large campuses that the government has given you land, people are making houses. Why are universities making houses? They're not using the land for purposes of education. They're using it for houses. They're not making the land for purposes of raising revenue. They're making houses. Universities are not producing research. So how can you gain respect? When we try and hold conference or webinars, professors have no time to come to them. Vice Chancellor says they're too busy. They're too busy to conduct academic inquiry. They're too busy to talk to each other. How can you gain respect that way? So face the question rather than blaming them. Face the question. We have no respect. Hassan Shah Saab, how do you face that? I am afraid I don't entirely agree with you that universities are going to, you know, it's like asking your servant to behave on his own a lot better. We have a place in society and uh, I, I think it's, it's not a good place to be in. And we, we, uh, I think people make appropriate from time to time noises. And uh, I think it's to no avail uh, what we expect from ourselves and what uh, uh, we want to do, I think the, the rulers are not willing to play ball with us. Uh, they have the bureaucracy who tells them how to do things and that is how they do them. That is why we, we are where we are. Why does a school teacher uh, get the same salary or at least he used to some years ago, the same as you would be paying your cook? What is the value you are putting on education as a society? And I think these questions cannot in, uh, be answered by the, by the universities only. They have to be answered by everyone together if we are to make something out of this country. You cannot have any islands of excellence, uh, as Dr. Naim said, in a sea of uh, ignorance. I think that is uh, uh, what your expectation seems to be, that suddenly there should be these bright uh, stars, you know, uh, and all around that uh, is a black hole. That is, that is not about to happen. I think we all sink and swim together as societies and as countries. And somewhere, I don't think we have got our priorities right for the last 70 years. We've got them right maybe in stops and starts, but not as a whole.
and uh, i think uh, you as i think you uh, you're talking to the uh, people in the education sector you should be talking to people who manage us and why do they want to manage us and why shouldn't there be a new paradigm to look at the way universities are supposed to function hum to is maashre ke kami hai matlab ye to traditionally aise chalta aa raha hai kaam ke master log jo hai wo yahi karte hai i remember when i started teaching at punjab university i had gone to my village and they said i'd come back from doing a post doc abroad and they said what are you doing so i said i'm talk, teaching at punjab university a few months later i went again so they said what are you doing so i said i'm teaching at the university so they said hali shot nahi latha tada so that is where we stand i mean i uh, they would have been happier seen me in a place like a patwari or a thanedar or a, as an assistant commissioner if i had done very well in life but uh, you know so these things need to be addressed um, i think don't put all the onus on the universities which are in any case uh, places where we have our issues we have our problems we we have management issues everything is there and all these universities which are being opened up they are maybe the, if the, in the long term it may prove okay or may not i don't know but they are certainly being opened up for the wrong reasons it is to get your mna or mpa a uh, vote i mean you uh, look at uh, places where money has gone into education and look at the uh, votes that mna has got i don't want to take names but that is what has happened and uh, so please stop putting all the onus on the universities uh, we talk we shout we do everything we get into trouble also <laughs> i can talk to you about my troubles if you want to hear them but i don't want to bring them up on this forum but that is what happens you don't remain popular with people sure. and uh, so i think uh, uh, we need a more educated uh, government i think a more education conscious government what do they want from education where is our industry the young lady just now was talking about internships where that industry should come in and do things where is your industry is your economy sinking or is it growing and if everything is sinking around you universities will always also sink few of us individuals may continue to do this that or the other but that is it okay Th- things run on money i remember Good. you asking me where is your business plan yeah i'm not uh, about to give you a business plan my business plan is going to be very different it's not going to be about money it it's going to be asking for money it's going to be asking for more freedom it's going to be asking for uh, the faculty to go abroad and spend time abroad and doing conferences yes we do seminars and webinars and we've been doing them during this covid period also maybe you've not heard of them maybe universities have not been as bad as you think that they've been but uh, you know i think there is some onus on us but i think a lot of the onus is not on us okay great thank you thanks naim sir professor naim uh, pakistan uh, has you know a agriculture economy so probably uh, we should be uh, targeting uh, the areas where we can make some contributions probably the, uh, the global world has gone to the high tech so that has left uh, space for us for uh, you know food production food security for uh, middle east for europe even for china we have cpac and you know uh, i i wanted that uh, we should sort of uh, copy some discipline from chinese uh, uh, the hard work that they bring into their industrial output and probably uh, uh, because they have gone to the next generation of the technology so they will be leading some some uh, primary industries for us uh, to grow so i think we have to uh, as a good uh, agriculture country we should we can, we still have opportunity for to produce enough food uh, animal food fish food uh, crops for the whole world so that is uh, probably our uh, strength uh, and then some uh, electricity and mining from dpn you know all over the world uh, my personal uh, uh, interest is uh, fisheries and aquaculture 80% of the uh, global fisheries comes from the aquaculture industry from the seas our uh, arabian sea coast of 900 km is virgin from gwadar all the way to karachi not a single fish farm is there uh, on the open seas uh, this is the uh, technology china
is leading. So we have to sort of uh, do something uh, like a private public partnership. You know, uh, we are having these fancy words for last 20, 30 years, but I tried, but uh, I was not able to register my university of Baltistan IT company with the uh, ministry, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, the commission, which is dealing with the company's laws. Uh, I was not able to have my uh, software company and uh, mining company because I want to do a business uh, and consultancy and research and development and create and, uh, and get a share of, of the natural wealth which can be you know exploited in that region. But uh, HEC stops me from doing that. NAB says, don't do this. Uh, we'll be, you'll be held accountable because no matter how much uh, you know, uh, private and public uh, share is there uh, from the university side. So, you know, these are some of the challenges, uh, uh, you know, they say that a American, uh, North American PhD graduate uh, can register his uh, personal company in one day. In Pakistan, to register one's company, it takes months and months and maybe 20 to 30 departments. So ease of business is not that good, even for our uh, incubation centers, for, for our uh, graduates. Uh, we are asking that they should be entrepreneurs, but every they are, they are creating uh, hurdles for them. So I think, you know, uh, this is the area where we should uh, keep banging uh, uh, to make the uh, students independent thinker. And once like we can create a magic like this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this Microsoft or uh, Bill Gates or uh, Google, I think that has driven whole of the uh, Western European or uh, North American culture. So if our genius students can create one or two models, then the bureaucracy will uh, listen to them. They will come to their help and probably that model uh, of business can be promoted. So idea is that our small scale uh, pilot uh, innovations, pilot projects, uh, they have to be shared within uh, Pakistani society and uh, abroad. And that can make uh, money because that is the driving economies in the West. So I think uh, our genius students, uh, they create something, but they sell it uh, to the Western countries because we don't have uh, a mechanism uh, to translate those ideas into uh, entrepreneurship and business incubation, although we talk a lot about this. So these are, I think, uh, we should uh, help the universities and Naim ease sir, them. Naim sir, you are absolutely right. But my challenge is that this is the job of the universities to produce evidence and data to this effect. At TID, we have started, we have done um, a huge study on deregulation, exactly what you're saying, trying to figure out where the costs are. Now, why has this not been done by the universities? I'm amazed. This should have been done 30 years ago. Now, next, we have also started networking all the universities. We've got a project called Rasta, where we are getting all the universities to give us proposals. And we've got a huge committee. We do all kinds of things. The tragedy is the proposals coming from universities are so bad, are so bad that we have great this, this time we got a hundred proposals. We didn't want to accept any one of them. HEC also put out a grant uh, mechanism last year. They had quite a few proposals, not a single proposal succeeded because they were bad proposals. Now the question is universities can keep ducking the real issue, but there is an issue. Now, of course, science and technology, okay, I won't comment on that. But in our area, which is not a small area, which is public science, social science, a huge area, public policy, social science, a huge area, we have failed totally. And I say this with full um, you know, confidence. And I think this is something that we should face up to. If we have failed, then let us see, why should the, uni why should the public policy maker, why should the civil servant have any respect for us at all? because you're not producing anything. So I think there is something here that we should face up to. Uh, gee, I am scientist, say Mohsin Saab, Dr. Mohsin Saab. Then I'll come to you, Mansoor Saab and Adelton Saab. Gee, tell me. Gee, I would say that funding requirements are for, uh, you know, they're not adequate, so government should increase their funding. But then that- Sorry, Dr. Mohsin, I, I hate to say this. G funding G is available when it comes to making faculty housing and vice chancellor housing. I mean, let's look G at ourselves too. If vice chancellors have huge houses and if the faculty has houses, then we can't say we are short of funding. And Mansoor sir, we can also keep our brains here if we, if we wanted to. 
if we really wanted to raise the funding. <laughs> but if we want to make houses first, then I'm sorry, you know, there's a problem. Ji. Uh, Nadeem Sahib Ji, you have heard the whole thing. Funding is there's, there's not for houses or for cars or for... It should be for research. It should be for scholarships for students on need-based and some on merit-based. That is one thing. Second is training. Uh, some of that funding must be used for training of vice chancellors and staff members uh, in different administration, in uh, uh, accounts, uh, in making these universities sustainable. Or uh, I think, you know, we are improving. Uh, a few universities, including ourselves, just our lambs, IBA, we do take up uh, uh, challenges in public sector, uh, in donor-based uh, research that is required. So slowly we are moving in that direction. Not all universities, very few, maybe a small percentage, uh, but that needs to be copied in all other universities, public sector organizations. Thank you. G. Professor Lyleton. Thank you. Um, I guess this is one of those sessions where I actually learn a lot and it's been very beneficial for that reason. Um, I guess I kind of feel also as a relatively recent entrance that what I'm hearing are the challenges that lie ahead for me. Um, I think uh, a lot of things have been said here uh, and, and, and I will say the more positive ones are the ones we're striving for, uh, but I understand there's obstacles as well. Um, but I think everything that's been rhymed off and certainly training opportunities, uh, application, um, uh, you know, one of the comments was made in incubation center. I mean, we have a new campus center. We're building that in there. So on the one hand, I guess what I'm thinking when I hear all this is that, uh, yeah, we're trying to address these and to a greater or lesser extent, sometimes we're able to. Um, but what I'm also hearing is big time, uh, having been here for one year, <laughs> the road ahead. And I guess I kind of feel like uh, there's a sort of a mountain range up there and I'm on a, I'm on a hill looking out, uh, looking ahead, hoping I can scale it. Um, but a bit of a reality check. I guess that's what I'm kind of leaving this meeting as you uh, as, as, as you close it up is, again, learned on a lot, uh, agree with many of the things said, um, maybe still in up the optimistic phase, but again, appreciate uh, Professor Hassan Shah's comments, which um, I think are good because I guess as, as he often hears me uh, say around here is question of balance um, or question of one day at a time. Um, I guess I'll, I'm always one that's, that will find hope wherever I can take it. And again, characterizing this conversation, I, I do see reasons for hope. Um, I do think it's not an all negative picture, um, but big time challenges. And I hope I'm up to it. I look at the other vice chancellors, directors, um, wish them the best too, and appreciate this chance to compare notes like this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Edelton. Uh, and Sur Malik, sir. Okay, uh, I'm taking a leaf out of uh, Dr. Naim Saab's uh, uh, inputs just now. Uh, perhaps, you know, for the audience also, I set up the country's first technology incubation center at uh, uh, NASC way back in 2002. So we have uh, mentored and launched more than 10,000 startups in Pakistan since last 20 years. And we've added billions of dollars into our economy. We have not noted it down. We've got companies which are $10 million worth, $50 million worth over the last 20 years. That is one thing. Second is what Dr. Namesab said. I totally support him. I went voluntarily myself, set up the first technology incubation center at University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, what he was talking about, agricultural economy. So that was set up 10 years back when Shogat Arinsa was the then finance minister in one of the different government. So we set it up there. And uh, last about two years, we've, we have also held mentored more than 100 aerospace startup companies. So we are, we are here voluntarily. We can come over to his university if he wants to set up an incubation center. But he is absolutely right. We can do a lot in the agricultural you know, sector in Pakistan. We've tried to set up, we help, you know, fast, set up their campus in Faisalabad also. We helped her do the networking with the Dr. Nadeem Sahib keeps on pointing out between FAST, Faisalabad and University of Agriculture, Faisalabad. And to my utter shock, if I tell you and for my audience also, you will be shocked to know that the Agricultural College, Faisalabad was a pre-partition 
research, agriculture research institute, and the first IITs, first IIT directors who went from Faisalabad after the partition to India, they were the founding directors. That's how the agricultural university Faisalabad has contributed not only uh, to our agricultural sector, but also in setting up the two IITs, the founding directors in India. So that's a very old research institute and we've helped them out in launching and reducing their you know, gap between the agriculture sector and the academia. Thank you for pointing it out, Dr. Naim, and I wanted to yeah, submit this contributions that NAS Technology Incubation Center has been making last 20 years. Thank you. I'm going to quickly just say one quick thing is prompted by what was just said, because I think it's an acknowledgement of some of the history. And I think, uh, again, people that know me know that I, 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 talk, I look about the history to some extent as well, because I think you need to know where you've been in terms of where you're going and mention some of the people that have come out of the universities in Pakistan. I guess in Foreman, uh, we're proud of the fact that those that established both the PCSIR and its equivalent institution in India were both forming grads. Of course, that's a long time ago. But when you look at that history, when you see the picture, I guess this is in the science area, science era of those uh, chemistry labs, of those physics labs, of the early work that uh, Foreman did in terms of applied chemistry, uh, working with the people here. That's a great history. I'll go back to the very beginning because, uh, you know, we, we're a venerable institution and I don't want to go back too far necessarily. But they say when Dr. Foreman ordered science equipment from North America and it arrived, the students gathered around and were saying, wah, wah. And you look at that and what you think is that's the enthusiasm. That's the enthusiasm you want to count and calculate in students that when they go into a lab, they say, wah, wah. And this, this would have happened in the 1880s. Uh, so I think there is, again, I, I, I don't like to end things on a, on a pessimistic note. I do think, and I, I, I'll also say that, been here for a year, uh, did teach in a sort of adjunct kind of way at American University for three years before I came here. These are the undergraduates, not the graduate students I'm talking about. But those undergraduates would have been good in any classroom, anywhere that I'm familiar with, anywhere in the world. Uh, and I think that also feeds into the graduates as well. I mean, I haven't said that in the classroom so much, but I've, I've met them and some of the work they're doing. Uh, even in the public policy area, Center for Public Policy and Governance here just had a book launch yesterday, China and um, and Pakistan, and we had people coming in, listening in from uh, from, from, from various countries, including uh, North America and Europe and Sri Lanka, uh, and even next door India, and a, a nice piece of work actually done, in this case, in the public policy arena. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kayum Saab, would you like to say anything? Kayum Sab, unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. Ji. Sorry, sorry. No, I was saying that, Dr. Nadeem, you have very, you are a very smart moderator. Um, you have very smartly tried to save the policymakers whenever it comes to the policymakers. And as policymaker, if it is required to really respond and hiding those policymakers at the back and uh, hitting the poor academics, I mean, at the pain area. So that we could really, I mean, speak out whatever we are actually facing at the moment. But secondly, I mean, honestly, the universities do not have these large housing societies and housing schemes and vice chancellor houses. Uh, the universities, whatever the universities get, Dr. Nadeemulak, that can be verified. Whatever formula HEC is using, the universities get at an average of 30 to 40 percent. They, they can meet the total expense, recurring expense only. Uh, to the range of 30 to 40 percent of their total expenditure. So they are actually expecting too much from the universities with these challenges. Yes, it is not really the only factor. Uh, what is effective usage of those uh, that that money which is coming to the universities? But uh, I mean, 40 percent coming from government and 60 percent to be managed by the universities. That's a, actually a mismatch. Anyway, we we are facing, but. Uh, nevertheless, the universities need to improve the research culture, and that cannot be really uh, uh, actualized unless and until all of the partners really start playing their own part uh, of the job. Uh, so blaming only one part probably is not going to fix the issue. Fair enough, fair enough. Thank you, folks. I think this has been a wonderful discussion. We'll continue it. We'll do it again every Thursday, Friday for the next three or four weeks that we'll call Tariq Banuri and the policymakers and give it to them. Um, and I keep Tariq Banuri informed on this anyways. Look, the issue is hope. 
I don't have much hope. I'm sorry. I want to end on a despondent note. To tell me that something happened in 1880 or 1920 or 1947, we made 75 years of a mess, a huge mess in Pakistan. You can see that in the politics. You can see that in, in every area, not just the university, every area. This is kind of the, the way we manage our cities, the way we manage our state enterprises. We've talked about it at length. We do all kinds of webinars on this. I have yet to see any hope in Pakistan. The way I look at the world internationally, historically, Jonathan Adelton and uh, Hassan Shah, etc. Universities have brought about a large change in the world. Universities were responsible for many things. Newton worked at a university, Adam Smith worked at a university, most academics worked at a university and they brought about change in the system. That's because universities created knowledge. Geology happened through universities. All kinds of things happened through universities. They created knowledge. Our universities, unfortunately, only teach and teach badly. Most students complain. I've held a number of sessions. Most students complain teachers are teaching with old notes and they are quite disgusted by it. So the issue is we really have to begin to rethink the whole education paradigm. And I agree, I'm not saying at all, I'm not absolving the civil service. I'm not absolving the bloody law that was created, that stupid law that I've also gotten, I'm trying to change. This law that gives you 10 senates and two syndicates and three, this and four, that. I mean, that nonsense that comes from the church in the old medieval church era law we passed with so many chancellors and this, that, et cetera, which is absolutely a joke. Yes, of course. But it's our job to critique that law. It's our job to pre present new ideas. That's where the universities have failed. And that's where I have no hope because universities are not a factory of producing knowledge. Universities have become dominant places. And yes, Mansur Sahib, we'll, will you come to Pite, please? We'll invite you. We'll give you the work that we've done on the brain drain 30 years ago. We need to arrest the brain drain. But the brain drain cannot be arrested if you make more Thekadar universities. I would much rather that we stop making universities and fill our universities with professors, with the best professors we can find, whether local or foreign, and ensure that we've got credible professors. Unfortunately, that's a dream that Hassan Shah, the people sitting here, we won't see in our lifetimes. We might see it 100 years from now, but that doesn't leave me with much hope. Thank you very much, folks. We'll do it again next time, inshallah. Please join us in the next session. The more people who join, join, the better off we will be. In fact, if the vice chancellors had any gumption, I would say the vice chancellors... I can't would hear actually... you, Dr. Sorry, you can't hear me? If the vice chancellors had any gumption, the vice chancellor would sign a petition to the government saying no more universities. Fund our universities instead of making more brick and mortar. But then the vice chancellors can't come together. Thank you. All the best, folks. Khuda Hafiz.